So the next speaker is Dr. Rebecca Smithers from the University of Oxford, who's going to be speaking on quenching galaxies and the search for evidence of AGN feedback. Rebecca. Yes. <laughs> Oh, wonderful, thank you. Yes, yeah, so earlier today uh, in this room, there was a sort of meeting of UK minds that were experts on this idea of quenching. And um, you have to forgive us because we kind of assume that that is a ubiquitous term now. <laughs> and I was quickly reminded by the organizers of the, this meeting now that um, nobody understands what that is. <laughs> and so I guess I should start by explaining that that term really umbrellas every process that affects star formation rate in a galaxy over from you know the early universe to now uh, and also I have a, another uh, jargon word in my title as well the AGN as well hopefully more of you may have come across that this is the idea of an active galactic nuclei in a galaxy so a black hole that is currently active and accreting material uh, and therefore growing as well so you've got two separate objects there the galaxy and the black hole and we think that those two things co-evolve as well. Co-evolution means how do you grow those objects simultaneously throughout the universe's lifetime. And to do that, you need hydrogen gas. You need somehow to feed the hydrogen gas down to the black hole whilst also feeding the galaxy some hydrogen gas so it can make stars out of it. But then by feeding the black hole, we think that that then can output energy into the galaxy that can also stop that star formation process as well. And this is where this word feedback uh, comes into it. So this sort of process that by feeding one thing, you, you hit back into the other. But what does all this mean in the context of galaxy evolution? So let me start off by showing you a plot that hopefully uh, some people may have seen before. This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which surveyed a million galaxies, uh, very local universe galaxies in the northern hemisphere uh, from New Mexico. And what I've done here is I've plotted the R-band magnitude against the U minus R color. So this is magnitude against color, we call it color magnitude diagram, right? Similar to stars. What you have is a lot of blue low mass things in one corner, and you have a lot of red high mass things in the other corner. And you should be able to see from the contours in that plot that you have two distinct populations popping out there. The blue cloud and the red sequence is what we call them, okay? And so we call it basically a, a sort of a dichotomy. You know, you have this um, split in the population of galaxies. And therefore we say that a quenching process is anything that can take a galaxy from that star forming blue cloud to the red dead sequence where you've got a lot of older stars left that are sort of the, you know, the burning embers in a galaxy rather than the sort of blue hot stars that are very short lived. And you notice also they pass through something we've dubbed the Green Valley and there's lots of debate about whether that's a real population or whether it's just sort of a, a crossover of those two things. Um, but what we also find when we look at this uh, diagram as well is that we see obviously with the blue cloud we see a lot of things that are spiral shaped beautiful blue spirals as we're used to seeing. And then in the red sequence, we see lots of red blobbish spheroidal galaxies, okay? And so for a long time, people use that diagram to say, okay, well, if I select the blue things, I'll get all my spiral galaxies. And if I select the red things, I'll get all of the elliptical galaxies. But then some of you may have uh, be actually even contributed to the project that I'm about to mention. Galaxy Zoo came along and found out that actually if you visually look at all of those galaxies, you find that about 30% of the red sequence is actually spiral shaped. And actually in the blue cloud, you see maybe a lot less, but like maybe like five, 10% or so are actually sort of blue ellipticals, these blue spheroids. And so we can think about now in that picture, if we put them on our color magnitude diagram, it's not as clear cut as it was before because that quenching process that's moving stuff from the blue cloud to the red sequence is not just shutting off star formation, but it could be changing the very nature of the galaxy as well. It could be changing the very shape of the galaxy. And so we think there's a lot of different mechanisms that can cause that trigger from the blue cloud to the red sequence. 
but we all think they act very differently. So like all good scientists, we've split them again into a dichotomy, <laughs> stealing from biology as we do it now, uh, to split them into nature versus nurture, okay? This idea of if you left a galaxy alone to be by itself with its very own nature, what would happen internally in the galaxy to change it or to quench it, to stop it from forming stars? And we also have another dichotomy within that dichotomy <laughs> of whether that happens from the inside out or from the outside in in a galaxy. So those two little red arrows are showing on that left side there. Then we have the nurture side of things, which is what environment do you find a galaxy in? Is it in a low-density environment? Is it in a high-density environment where it's going to have a lot of close passes with other galaxies? It's going to interact a lot. You're going to get a lot of gravitational interactions, tearing stuff apart, and maybe even some mergers as well. That's where we call this sort of nurture side of things. So what I like to do now is I have a very strong feeling that nobody remembers anything anymore unless it's presented to them as an XKCD plot. Um, and so I'm going to go through this idea of internal and external quenching processes and whether also we think they're fast or slow for my theoretical understanding of them. Okay? So I've already mentioned one of those processes, mergers, things that happen in very dense environment. Okay? If you think they're very fast, they're an external process, I'm going to throw up minor mergers as well there. So this is, I'll get to what we mean by that, but that's kind of like if you merge with something your same size as you, have you or if you merge with something a lot smaller than you. Then we've got this idea of environmental quenching, anything to do with your environment that's going to affect your galaxy if you're in a dense environment, if you're a low dense environment. Something called RAM pressure stripping as well is down there in the slow side of external things, but we'll get to that again. Then we've got morphological and mass quenching on the slow and internal side, and then something called AGN feedback, which is that process I was alluding to at the beginning. But the eagle-eyed among you will have noticed there is a question mark at the end of AGN feedback. And again, we'll get to why that's there as well. So some of those you may have heard of. Some of those you will never have heard of. Because <laughs> again, it's one of these things that quenching experts like to come up with to describe the things that we see. And so what I'm going to do is just sort of go over each of these processes and just explain why we think that they could cause a galaxy to stop forming stars. Okay? So let's start with mergers. I think that's something that we might all be familiar with, that two galaxies can come together collide and merge, okay? And so what we think happens in that merger, you would think that obviously you're going to bring a lot of gas in by forming two, two things, by forcing two things to collide, which you are. Okay, you're going to bring fresh gas into, a, into an old galaxy if, if you have something called a gas-rich merger. But what that's going to cause is lots of starbursts because you're going to shock that gas and cause it to form more stars. But then you kind of exhaust all of your gas very quickly by doing that. And so what you end up with is something where you've had a huge big burst of star formation, which has then effectively quenched the galaxy that way. Okay, so you've used it up very, very quickly. And what you also get in a merger is a redistribution of your angular momentum. You ruin that nice orbital sort of stars going round in very, very precise orbits in a beautiful spiral structure. You dissipate the angular momentum and you end up forming something with a massive bulge in the center or maybe even something that is entirely bulge as well. And we think that depends on this thing we call mass ratio. I talked about major mergers. Major merger is something where you have, like, if you have a galaxy that is, say, 10 to the 11, so like 10 billion times the mass of the sun, 100 billion times the mass of the sun, sorry, and you merge it with something else that's 100 billion times the mass of the sun, then that's going to be a major merger. If you take a 100 billion solar mass galaxy and you merge it with a billion solar mass galaxy, that's a minor merger, okay? That's not going to have as large of an effect, and we don't think that will form as large of a spheroidal component in the middle of the galaxy. And so I think what we can kind of summarize this as is basically you just use your gas up too quick. And you'll notice for the rest of this talk, we really are focusing on gas and not stars here when we actually talk about quenching star formation, which I think was one of the main themes that came out of today's discussion meeting as well. Okay, hopping over now from our little XKDC plot, you'll see I put it in the corner so you can remember where we are. We're hopping down now into the slower side of things. I think mergers happen quite quickly. Slower side of things is this idea of ram pressure stripping, okay? Now, this is the idea, if you're, if you're a galaxy in falling onto a big group of galaxies, okay, the energy in that group is going to be quite high, so the gas in between all of the galaxies is going to be quite hot. So as the, ga the galaxy falls in on the group or cluster, it's going to hit into that hot gas, and it's going to have its cold gas stripped off. It's basically going to sort of feel a pressure 
from the hot gas that it's infalling on as like a wind, right? I first had this process described to me as a graduate student as like riding a bike so fast that all of your hair falls off. <laughs> And I have been terrified of riding bikes ever since. <laughs> Never got on one again. Uh, but basically what happens here is that by stripping away that gas, you don't have any left for your star formation, essentially. The problem is this whole scenario had basically been used to describe the situation where we see galaxies in denser environments were more likely to be quenched. The denser you got, the higher your quenched fraction of galaxies. And so people were saying for ages, this is the reason why, ram pressure stripping. But recent simulations have said, actually, it's not very effective as a quenching mechanism. You can only strip, say, 40% of the gas from a galaxy by this process. And so really, the jury's still out on that one. There's a lot of debate going on in the community right now to try and figure out how important it is and what it can actually do to the galaxy. What it causes though galaxies to look like is, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but it's jellyfish galaxies. I thought I'd put a picture in because they look absolutely beautiful when this happens. Um, you can see the gas being stripped off. And also the shocks in that gas as it gets stripped off as well that trigger more star formation as it goes. So you get that same process of using up the gas too quick in those jellyfish tails. That all comes under environmental quenching though, around pressure stripping. It's something where in your environment that you're in, the galaxy group that you're in, it's gonna have some effect. Now, we're about halfway through my little XKCD plot now of uh, quenching mechanisms. So I thought I'd have a little bit of fun here. And also because, you know, I'm embracing my millennial nature and I can't suppress it for as long as an academic talk. So let's represent environmental quenching as emojis. Why not? Because we're here. <laughs> the first one on that is thermal evaporation, clearly. This is when basically you get a rapid rise in the temperature of the gas in your galaxy, the interstellar medium, due to contact with the intergalactic medium. So again, instead of stripping the gas, the hot halo gas in between all of these galaxies is gonna heat the, ga the gas in your galaxy itself. The second one there is viscous stripping, clearly. How could you not tell that from the emoji straight away? That is the interaction of the slow moving gas with the fast hot gas, again, of the stuff in between your galaxies. You can see here, like, it's, again, that interaction between cold gas in galaxy and hot gas in the outside that, in this case, actually causes outflows from the galaxy itself, which is very interesting. The next one down there might be more, a little bit easier to guess, possibly. It's quite topical. It's harassment. Uh, repeated high-speed galaxy-galaxy interactions. So this is where the galaxies in a group are being accelerated by the fact there is so many of them there. They're picking up speed by close-by encounters. And they have, instead of merging, they just have a lot of fly-by interactions that can actually, uh, again, heat the galaxy's gas supply by exchange of energy. The second one there is starvation which is basically you remove the galaxy's outer halo, which is going to feed it and funnel in more gas for it to, to form stars. And so if you remove that, you cut off its supply, basically, and you effectively quench your galaxy. Um, and again, the be-all and end-all, that comes down to gas. You've either heated the gas, you've expelled the gas, or you've, you've cut your supply off. And you realize as well, we sort of discussed this today, that this page kind of reads like a Quentin Tarantino movie as well. So we also definitely need better names for these processes, if anybody can think of any. OK. So we've done the external side. Let's hop over to the internal side and think about a galaxy's actual nature and what about the galaxy could cause itself to start quenching. So the first one on here is called mass quenching. And this idea was introduced not even a decade ago, really, by Peng et al. And they said it was any quenching mechanism that was independent of environment, like we just spoke about, but not of the galaxy's mass. That's what they said. They didn't really necessarily pinpoint a specific process that that could be down to. And so actually, the sort of community's fallen into two separate camps now. So on one side, we've got Darby Chattel Group. They say that's non-AGN-driven feedback mechanisms. So basically... You have a supernova in a galaxy, and that can cause gas to be expelled from the galaxy itself. Okay? And obviously, the more massive you are, the more stars you're going to have, the more supernova you're going to have. So the bigger effect it's going to have. And on the other side, you've got something called halo quenching processes. Um, and that's where basically, again, if you have a bigger ga galaxy, you're going to be embedded in a bigger halo of gas. And if you cut off that supply, then that impacts on the galaxy. So again, the bigger you are, the worse it is, and so it comes down to more stars equals bad, is what I've summarized that as there. 
Similarly, we have something called morphological quenching. And this is where the galaxy's own structure, just by being itself, <laughs> it affects its own star formation rate. Um, and that can be, again, through two different things. That can be prevention or consumption. So what I mean there is prevention is that you can have a very large bulge in the center of your beautiful spiral galaxy, and that can actually prevent the gas in the disk from collapsing and forming stars. So the gas will be there, it just can't collapse and form stars anymore. And then the other side is that you use it up. So for example, if you have spiral structure or a bar structure in your galaxy, that can actually funnel gas towards the center, where it, again, can get used up too quickly and exhausted by star formation. So if I would attempt to summarize that, I'd probably say the galaxy shoots itself in the foot, basically, just by being <coughs> itself. But where my heart truly lies now is this other quadrant of this XKCD gram that we haven't quite got to yet, and that's AGN feedback. And I said I'd come back to this qu big question mark that I have at the end of that as well. This is the idea that the black hole and the energy, energetic material and radiation given off by a black hole, so this is from the accretion disk around the black hole and the pressure that builds up around it as it tries to accrete too much material at once, can actually uh, throw off either what we call a wind from the black hole or jets, uh, huge jets. And that can either expel or heat the gas that you would need for star formation in the galaxy. So basically, the process of accreting onto the black hole is somehow going to give out energy that affects your galaxy. And theorists have been saying, this has to happen. If we do not have this in our simulations, this process, and we, we put it in to say, energy from black hole affects galaxy, then we do not reproduce our observations at all. Okay? So it's something a bit like this. This is called a, a galaxy a luminosity function. So you basically go out and count how many galaxies of certain brightnesses you see. And you say, do we see the same amount of faint galaxies as we predict there should be? And do we see the same amount of bright galaxies as we predict there should be. And hopefully you'll be able to see here that the observations, which is the blue curve, and the red curve, which is the theory, do not match. And the reason we've explained that at the low mass end is because you have supernova going off that, again, do that uh, feedback where they throw out energy and therefore throw out gas from the galaxy that prevents too many of these small things forming. You can actually sort of blow these small dwarf galaxies apart. And then at the high mass end, they say, well, it's actually due to AGN feedback. In theory and simulation, you make too many high mass galaxies. The sort of the star formation runs away in these high mass galaxies without this prevention mechanism of AGN feedback to stop that from happening. So that sounds great. The theorists, all convinced. Brilliant. There's so many, so many results and evidence showing that that has to be the case in so many different simulations. Observationally, though, I'd argue we haven't seen that yet. We've seen it in very specific individual cases in very small samples, but what the theorists are arguing is that it's happening across all galaxies, like population-wide, and I don't think we've seen that yet. What we have seen is that you get the largest AGN fraction, so the highest number of AGN that you find are in that green valley area, which is that place where stuff is moving from blue to red. And so you can kind of infer it from that that it must be happening. But that's the sort of the strongest evidence so far. And I think personally this is like the biggest challenge that we currently have to our best model of the universe, this idea of lambda CDM. I think it's the biggest challenge we have. So we've got around them all. We've talked about them all individually and we understand what they are. But the problem is when we discuss this today in our meeting, what we realize that this picture is that although it's probably right, and we could argue about where we'd put these specifically in, the, in these different quadrants, it probably looks a bit more like this. <laughs> because all of these mechanisms don't act alone. If you are going to have a merger, you're probably going to throw stuff into the center that's going to feed the, the AGN. If the AGN starts throwing out jets into the surrounding medium, that's going to hit on the stuff in between the galaxies that's going to have an impact on your environment. So then if your environment's hotter, that's going to cause more RAM pressure stripping. And if you strip off the gas from the galaxy, all that could go back to the AGN. And so there's these whole, you can get lost in this diagram, pinging around in various different loops, when you realize that actually what we've been focusing on these past couple of years is how these all act individually. And at one point or other, I think we all agreed today that 
all of these mechanisms, we were like, okay, so this is the most important one. At some point in the past sort of 20, 30 years, we were like, this is the most important one. Wait, no, this is the most important one. And slowly, I think we're coming to realize that actually, they all act sort of together in cahoots. Not one single mechanism can fully start, maybe start that quenching process, but it, they can't ensure the galaxy stays that way. And so they have to work together to do that. But what it means for us studying it is that quenching is messy. It's really messy. And it means it's really hard to, to pick things out of it. So as I said, where my heart lies is this process of AGN feedback, but it relies on so many other different things that are going on in the galaxy that you have to also attribute for those as well. But what I really want to do is say, okay, if I took a sample of AGN, these actively growing black holes that are giving off this energy, do I see a drop in the star formation rate in these galaxies that have these AGN? And if I compare it with stuff that's not got an active growing black hole, it's not throwing off energy, do I see the same thing or do I see something different? Okay. And so I thought, well, where can we start with this? Well, the first thing we can do is say, well, what's the simplest thing that we can ask and what can it tell us in the different circumstances? First of all, though, we need a sample of active galactic nuclei, okay? And so how do we pick out those? How do we pick out these actively growing black holes? So I introduce you to this uh, diagram. It's called the BPT diagram, after the three people that uh, came up with it. And what it does is it takes the spectrum of a galaxy and it looks at the emission lines in that galaxy and it says, how strong are those emission features? Could that emission feature have come from just from the energy from star formation? Or could it have come from, or could, or to get that high energy emission, do you need something much more energetic like an AGN? Okay? So it means that you end up with all the normal star forming galaxies down here at sort of the ratio between two different emission lines being like, okay, you can achieve that with just sort of energy from stars ionizing the gas. Or the stuff up here in this top corner where you're like, the only way you could achieve that ionization energy for that gas is from energy being given out by an AGN. And so that's how we select those out. Of course, we then use this same diagram to say, okay, well, then I want a sample of AGN, sure, but I want a sample of normal stuff as well to compare it to, okay? So we ended up getting about, I think it was like 1,000, 1,244 AGN from, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the survey of sort of a million galaxies. And then we got a control sample, which we matched in like redshift and mass and everything to give us a sort of a morphology as well, actually, to just sort of say, okay, nothing else is different except the fact that this one has an AGN and this one doesn't. We got about 6,000 of those, sort of like four or five or so per galaxy as like control. And so what I said before is the biggest evidence we have is obviously that these AGN and the red points here again in this diagram, they lie in that kind of green valley region on this color magnitude diagram between this blue cloud and red sequence. They're clearly transitioning, maybe not straight up as I had the arrows originally, but maybe sort of in this general direction. And so that's the biggest evidence we have for maybe the AGN is causing that transition. Maybe the AGN is stopping the star formation rate in these galaxies. So we can compare contours against points on one diagram and squint at it and go, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of convinced, I guess. But we can do something better, okay? We can actually do a bit of modeling and do a bit of statistics here as well. So what we can do is we can assume a model of what's happening in a, in a galaxy in terms of its star formation rate. We can say, let's assume that it's constant up until some time in the universe, TQ, time of quench, at which point it declines at some rate either extremely rapidly, like in the red curve there, or a little slower, like in the blue curve there. So it's just like an exponential decline in the star formation rate, okay? Then you can use a lot of other people's work where you say, okay, well, now I know how many stars I'm forming at every single time step. How much light does that give me, given that I formed that many stars? And so what would the color of those galaxies be, okay? So you can take those models and then you can turn those lines and sort of stars you're forming every time step into your optical color against this time, this is a near UV color. So UV is a really good probe of recent star formation. Okay, so it helps us break so the degeneracies we have to try and figure out what's recent and what's old stars in a galaxy. And so we can see the blue curve, which was a very slow decline as this galaxy is just sort of making its way slowly through the blue cloud. Whereas that red curve, which was just like whoosh, quenched pretty quick, straight away just went straight up to the red sequence, okay? Straight to being red. No star formation left at all. 
And again, we could compare contours and lines, but really what we want to do is use statistics. So here we actually used um, what's called Bayesian statistics and MCMC, which is a special sort of statistics we can use to say, okay, instead of comparing lines and contours, can you actually search in the full parameter space what the best model is, what's the best value of T, and what's the best, be best value of the rate of the quench as well, given the observations I have of this single galaxy. And so for a single galaxy, you can get, okay, this is our best model for the time the quenching happened and the rate that the quenching happened. And then we can plot that on a, a histogram to say, okay, in the AGN and in the inactive sample, what do those look like? What does the time of quenching look like? So that's what we're going to do here, okay? This is a nice little thing I've coded up. I called it star pi, so it's available for lots of astronomers to use. And I just like that little star. He's very happy. And so first of all, if we look at the rate that the star formation declines in a sample of AGN and a sample of inactive, inactive black hole hosting galaxies, okay? Black line there is the AGN and the red dashed line is the inactive, okay? And so these are slow rates on this side and we move towards more rapid rates. And what's really cool, I think, is that hopefully you'll be able to see is that for the AGN, there's this big boost at rapid rates. And if you remember on my XKCD plot thing at the beginning, I had the AGN up at the very fast quenching timescales. So that's promising. Suggests maybe that those are the ones causing this rapid quench. If we look at time instead, there you go, rapid decline. If we look at time instead, we can see another cool thing is that for the AGN, the quenching has happened like now. It's happened very recently compared to in the, in the inactive galaxies that don't have an actively growing black hole spewing out this energy into the galaxy. And so it's exciting. The this, this galaxies that are currently have an accreting black hole also have quenched very recently, which is really, really interesting, I think. Problem is, we could shout from the rooftops now and say, hey, we have evidence for in a population of galaxies of AGN feedback. That's what we wanted, right? But actually, it's a bit more difficult than that because you're not entirely sure whether the AGN is the cause or the consequence of that quenching. Like, is there a true correlation there or not? Is it just a coincidence that some other quenching mechanism has also triggered the AGN? Like, have you fed gas the center that's quenched the rest of the galaxy, but it's also fed the AGN? Or is it actually the AGN has switched on and caused that quenching? We don't quite know. Not with this data, at least. Big, big question, cause or consequence. Instead, what I'm looking at now is using a different set of data. This is something called an integral field unit survey. Okay, so this is a follow-up to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They've taken what was just the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, it was taking one spectra of galaxy, and they're now taking this huge big hexagon bundle that takes about 127 spectra for each galaxy. So basically you can like mosaic it up and sort of, sort of have a jigsaw puzzle piece of your galaxy. And so now at every single point in this galaxy, you can say, what is the time and the rate that the quenching is happening in all these different parts of the galaxy, okay? And what you can then do is say, okay, well, radially distance away from that central black hole in the middle, is there some sort of trend? As you see that energy move through the galaxy, can you see the star formation switching off as you go? And we have to change our code to do that a little bit because now we've got spectra and not colors, but that's great because it gives us more information. We've got emission lines and everything. And so that's now coded up in uh, something called Snitch as well because I decided it was about time astronomy had some Harry Potter references in it. But we have to be very careful about what we're actually going to expect to see. Do we actually expect to see a trend given our theory? Okay, so that would be what I've just called, talked about is something we call maintenance mode for AGN feedback. Okay, this is where you have the energy actually moving through the galaxy itself. You therefore expect, if you looked at the time and the rate that the quenching happened in the galaxy, to see some um, decline where you can see, okay, a while ago the AGN switched on and this, this sort of energy has been moving through the galaxy. And it happened quite fast and then in the rest of the galaxy before it's got there, it's been happening at some other rates. But there's another mode as well that we call explosive mode. And this is where actually instead of just sort of a wind that moves through the galaxy, you get these huge jets coming out of the black hole, or from the region around the black hole, um, that maybe would hit into that surrounding halo of gas that I was talking about before, this sort of intergalactic medium, and then cause it to cut off all at the same time, because you cut off the gas supply. And just to make it, and give you an idea of sort of what process we're talking about here and the scales, and obviously to keep it topical this week for M87, you know, you've got winds from the accretion disk itself rather than the full jet coming off the whole galaxy itself. So these are the jets that I'm talking about hitting into that intergalactic medium. 
And so I've started to do this and I'm getting some results. This was a plot I made two weeks ago. Um, and I don't understand this result yet. I haven't had time to pick out what it means. I haven't had time to pick out whether the different AGNs or things we see in x-rays and radios and infrared is giving us a different picture. But I hope what you'll agree with me is that when you stare at that picture of each, each one of these is an individual galaxy with its time of quenching and rate of quenching changing with the radius in the galaxy, is that quenching is messy, <laughs> as we agreed before. And uh, I think that was the conclusion of today's meeting as well, because we haven't solved this problem yet. And that's kind of disappointing at first, but then actually it means that there's still more science to do, which in my book is still a good thing, especially because it means we all still have a job. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We, we'd like uh, actually some answers from the audience now, not <laughs> yes, just please. That, but, yes, but, please. but you can yeah. ask questions as well. <laughs> yes, uh, well, sorry, yes, yes, please. Thanks, Becky. Great, great talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the status of quenching in simulations, which mm. you, you touched on. So uh, I think you were making the argument that the simulations predict AGN feedback as the cause of quenching. I, 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 is that actually true? I, I'd always assumed that the simulations needed something to do quenching to prevent getting too many massive galaxies, and AGN feedback was an easy way for, for simulators to do that. Or are there, are there things in the simulation that suggest it really is AGN <laughs> feedback? I think it's one of those things that if they don't have it, everything breaks down. You know, I think if you took each mechanism out of the simulation one by one, I think if you took AGM feedback out, that would be the one that had the most impact. So I think the, the thing that people say is that it's at the high mass end, that's the one that's going to have the biggest effect. And if you don't have it in. But I think they'd find that without the others, they also wouldn't get the same processes. But I think the others come more naturally out of just sort of gravitational effects and laws of physics rather than AGM that has been put in empirically. Uh, Miles? Uh, I was always taught that there are not two populations of red and blue mm -hmm. galaxies, but rather three. It's about 1% of much um, bluer galaxies than the main sequence. Mm -hmm. And you haven't sort of dealt with those at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel there's a, a further question. If you think of the analogy of um, how we've worked out the development of stars. We started out with a reasonably satisfactory explanation as to why stars are the sizes that they are. Mm -hmm. Now, galaxies do form a very clear um, pattern of size. Um, nobody seems to have any explanation whatsoever about this. And so my question is here that we know with stars that they start out, as it were, in the middle, then they go to the red side, and then they go to the much rarer and smaller blue sides. Um, there's no obvious reason why that should be the sequence. There's, it seems to me that before you can make realistic um, predictions about how galaxies evolve, you've got to start with a reasonable um, approach as to why they are the sizes and shapes that they are and as far as I can see this question simply has not been addressed so that is my question Okay. Um, yeah, so obviously, obviously, as I said, the shapes of galaxies does come into this massively. Um, it wasn't something I chose to focus on here, but there are many a people that are considering how these quenching mechanisms tie in here. Your question about starbursts, which are the, sort of the 1% that are much higher than the main sequence or this blue cloud, I think they come in, obviously, I'm not someone who really cares about star formation. I'm more someone that cares about not star forming. Um, and so for me, that star bursting scenario comes in where the fact that they're going to use up their gas very quickly in that scenario and then fall off. In terms of the sizes of galaxies, um, or the, sorry, yeah, like the sort of mass that they can reach, that's something that simulations are focusing on. 
And what they're finding is that, yeah, that AGM feedback is the limiting factor there of how big they can get. Now, obviously, for a galaxy, you're looking on a global scale, whereas a star is something that's much more sort of individual. And so you, you can sort of detect the individual pulsations of a star that do move it around on the, the stellar color magnitude diagram and, and move it from blue to red to blue to red and, and really sort of move it around like that. With a galaxy, it's a, it's a much more global scale. And so when you observe a galaxy, at least in the, the first half when I was talking about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, it's one observation. And so that very much averages what's going on across the whole galaxy. And that's why you obviously don't see as many sort of fluctuations in movement. But then also, um, that's why this IFU studies of manga, these ones where you put the, all of the spectra on the galaxy, are so crucial because they are really going to help us understand these things a lot better. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Let's thank Becky again.